Hello, my friends. Welcome to A Turn of Events, where we help put a positive spin on the future of your business. I'm Annette Naif, the CEO and Creative Director of Naif Productions. We are a strategic event production company specializing corporate, social, nonprofit, and weddings. If you are looking to produce a, uh, an event or a wedding or conference, gala, retreat, whatever that is, please reach out. We're happy to consult with you and also help you produce your event. If you are a wedding and event planner and you are looking to start your own wedding or event business, you must join us over at the Event Planner Society Facebook group. Great, great people over there. And I'm going to be launching a work, a masterclass actually in August. You are not going to want to miss this. If you're looking to start your own business, how to get clients, what do you do when you get the client and how to price your services. All really big things that event wedding and event planners ask me all the time, how to get clients, what do I do, how do I talk to them, all that great stuff. Event Planner Society, join us over at the Facebook group. My next guest, very excited to talk to him, is Robin Hills. We are going to talk about how to slow down to speed up in business. Event planning is fast, fast, fast all the time, and I can't wait to talk to him about this. Robin Hills is the director of EI for Change, an emotional intelligent for change, a company specializing in training, coaching, and personal development focused on emotional intelligence, positive psychology, and neuroscience. Robin has over 40 years business and commercial experience helping executives and leaders develop business performance through increased self-awareness and understanding of others. In his work, he uses in, in internationally recognized profiling tools to assess type, trait, behavior, and emotional intelligence. And he also is the author of two books in the Authority Guide series. Robin, welcome. Annette, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you ever so much for having me on your show. Yes, thank you so much. I'm very excited to have you. I love the background. Where is that? That is uh, a village called Edgeworth, which is where I live in northwest England. And that's Lovely. where I am at the moment. And I should be able to see this wonderful scene from my bedroom window, but I can't because there's a house in the way. Oh, that's a bummer. That's a bummer. Yes. I just got back from Italy celebrating a very big birthday and very excited. It was beautiful. We were there for a few weeks and it was fantastic. It's my third time going now and um, I love Italy. It's a beautiful place, but it kind of reminds me it's, you know, it's very beautiful. Okay. So how, tell me a little bit about how you got into this. I know you have lots of years in this, but let's just, you know, give a little overview of how you started out and what brought you to this. Well, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, Annette. When I started my career all those years ago, the term emotional intelligence had not even been invented. So uh, I can't really say I planned out at a career uh, looking at and working with emotional intelligence because it's kind of emerged and evolved as I've worked through my career. Yeah. I've been specializing in this area with EI for change for 15 years now so well established in the field and it's something that I thoroughly enjoy yeah okay great that's awesome so what is emotional intelligence and why is it important for leaders and managers well I think it's important for everybody but specifically because you're talking about event planning and you're talking about the corporate world let's concentrate on emotional intelligence for leaders and managers emotional intelligence very very simply is the way in which you combine your thinking with your feelings in order to make good quality decisions and in order to build up authentic relationships that's it being smart with your feelings yeah, which is really tough. You know, doing events is very emotional. <laughs> it can be a very emotional it thing. Is. Weddings, they're spending a lot of money and there's a lot of emotions involved. So what we think they might be, you know, thinking about and their emotions is a whole other thing. I, I've recently had somebody tell me that, you know, you're like a therapist for us. So that pretty much kind of tells you what we have to deal with. <laughs> yes, saying. that's a good way of looking at it yeah. because you are actually working yeah. with people's emotions, dealing with them. They oh. are very intense and you've got to manage your own emotions in those circumstances. That's true. And I always tell, you know, all of my students to, 
work out, eat right, get lots of rest, drink lots of, I mean, that's so important to take care of yourself because even you have to be strong to do events because that can be wearing on you when you're doing, you know, events set up and working it. It's a lot. By the end of an event, I am completely spent. I always, you know, take care of myself, especially I don't book anything the day after because I'm fried after, especially it gets harder as you get older. So it's one of those. So it is. I, well, uh, look, let's let's explore that a little bit further, because uh, a, a fundamental part of emotional intelligence, which people find quite surprising when I state it up front, is that you've got to learn to be selfish. Now, what I, what I mean by that is not very self-centered and dominating other people to get exactly what you want. That's not what I mean at all. Mm -hmm. It's self-ish. You've got to look after yourself before yeah. you can look after other people. That's right. So when you were flying to Italy or when you were flying back from Italy, what did the aircraft crew tell you to do in the event of a decompression? Right. Put the oxygen mask on yourself before you fix yeah. other people. And right. that's the way you've got to look at it. You've got to eat the right things, get the right level of exercise, drink in a uh, drink water, drink in moderation. Drink alcohol too. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the yeah. wedding, alcohol will flow yeah. freely. And, and there is an event where you can actually say, do you know, I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to go out of my normal um, production, of my normal uh, um, way of working and living. I'm going to have a, a a, a chance to really engage with people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be with family and friends. Let's eat, let's drink, let's be merry. But do it once in a while, not right. every day. Yeah. And nobody else can eat that sandwich for you. Yeah. Nobody else can drink that cup of coffee for you. Nobody else can do your exercise for you. And quite honestly, nobody else can go to the toilet for you. So you've <laughs> got to do all those things yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I know I always try to, you know, encourage my team to take care of themselves. I always get a massage after my events the next day because yeah. everything hurts, you know, and, yes. um, you know, that just rejuvenates me and makes me feel a lot better. And it's I always book that out, you know, take care of myself yeah. the next day. So how is emotional intelligence related to mindfulness? Well, let's have a look at what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is being aware of what's going on uh, in a non-judgmental way in the present moment and to do so uh, in a rational and objective way. So emotional intelligence is having this awareness in the present moment of how you're feeling, what your emotions are, what is driving you and what you need to do to build up these authentic relationships relationships, what you need to do in order to make these authentic decisions. You need to be able to work very much in the present moment. So I'm not working uh, in an hour's time. Uh, I'm not working around what I'm going to be doing in an hour's time. Uh, I might be planning and preparing it if I'm not talking to you, Annette. Mm -hmm. But what I've got to do is to concentrate on what am I doing now? What can, can I control now? What am I in control of? And working with that and doing so very objectively and very rationally. Very easy to say, very difficult to do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It really is. So in your experience, how can leaders encourage their teams to embrace a slower pace when necessary without sacrificing productivity? Well, I think people have got to be very goal oriented. They've got to realize what it is that they're trying to achieve. They've got to realize what it is that they're in control of. And um, let's get over this myth of the fact that people can multitask. Um, no, we can't multitask. The brain is not set up that way. It's very good at switching between tasks. And Annette, it seems that women are much better at doing it than yeah. men. Yeah. But um, in terms of multitasking, forget that you multitask. Yeah, you might be working on a lot of tasks at any one moment. But when you're doing one thing, you're not doing another. And when you're right. doing another thing, you're not doing that other thing. So just concentrate on doing what it is that you need to do and make sure that you do it to the best of your ability. And then when you've finished it, 
move on to something else. Now, again, very, very easy for me to say, very difficult to do in practice. Uh, and I think the other thing with regards to slowing down in order to speed up, it's knowing when to say no and knowing how to say no. And a lot of people will talk to me, oh, I must be customer focused. Um, well, yes, you must be customer focused. But in terms of being customer focused, you've actually got to help the customer make the decisions that they need to make. And often that's saying to the customer, no, you can't have that. No, I can't do that. No, that's not possible. Uh, let's see what it is that you're trying to achieve and let's see how I can help. And then it's knowing what your limits are. And the other important factor is um, in terms of uh, speeding down, uh, slowing, slowing down in order to speed up, is understanding other people's urgency and yeah. not taking on board other people's urgency. Right. If something is urgent, why is it urgent? If it's, if it's down to somebody else's bad planning, then it's not my responsibility. So you've got to learn to turn around to that person and say, no, I can't do it. I haven't got the time. Yeah. This is what I can do. Uh, and then negotiate around that. Right. When I know this, when I first started, I've had my business 13 years now. And when I first started, of course, you say yes to everything, which you want, you're building your business and you know, I made no money, you know, I was like, yes. you know, I made a negative, I figured it out when I really learned how to price my services, I figured out I made a negative $52 an hour. So that didn't feel good. We changed that up. But, um, and one of the things I learned, and it's very hard to, you know, it's very, you have to, if someone's hired you to produce their events, they hired you for a reason. You are the expert. You're the one they're helping them. So you need to set the boundaries, set the rules of how you work, show them how your systems are and how you work. That's hard to do when you first start because you're nervous. If you've got a corporate client and they can be overbearing, you get, you know, so many years in the business. I've been doing this over 30 years. And I, you know, again, the business 13 years, you really learn how to take control, stay in control of, you know, the client hired you and it's your systems. And, you know, there's a, there's a system of the way you plan it. And I just tell them, this is how we're going to do it. Now, sometimes we have to take on some corporate you know, internal procedures and things like that, that's fine. But for the most part, we have our systems, we follow them and that's the way it is. Um, another thing when you said, you know, uh, about saying no, um, I learned also is one of my clients and I'm kind of saying this out to my event planners who are watching here on our Facebook group. Hello to everyone out there. And um, we, uh, I had a, someone call, a client call, and they had interviewed five planners prior before they got to us. And each one of, they had a, it was a very big gala. There was like 1,400 people. There were a lot of, um, um, there was a lot of decor. So there was a lot of setup time that was going to have to happen. And they only had three hours set in the time with the hotel for setup three hours, which was never going to be able to happen. So I said to them, you cannot set this up in three hours. Now, I probably would have, and all of the other planners said, sure, no problem. We can do it. We can do it. But they kind of figured that, you know, there was something wrong with that. I don't want to jeopardize my business and fail when I can't get it set up in time. So I said to them, you're not going to be able to do it. You need to go back and ask for more time. And they ended up giving us the job because I said, I can't do that. Like, I'm not going to be able to yeah. do that. I need more time. So I learned like it's okay to tell them what they need to, what needs to happen with the event, right? Not just let them take over. So that's really, really good points. Um, and, you know, if you don't get it, you don't get it. There'll be other things, you know. No, but then uh, they're hiring you for your expertise. They're right. hiring you because they can't do the job themselves. They're hiring you as a professional. Exactly. So there's an expectation that they will have that you can actually say, look, if I've only been given three hours, that's not enough time for me to do my job. Right. So you've just got to turn around and, and say no. It is very, very hard. The easiest thing to do is to say yes and try to work it out. But ultimately, it's, fail, it's only going to make you look bad, right? It, it is. 
it's it, it's your quality, it's your reputation that's on the line, and you've got to remember that. Exactly, and it just it does come with experience, and confidence is everything. It does, it I does, and it comes with your emotional intelligence it, as well. Does. As much as I try to teach it, it's you know it does take time, but. I think just reassuring and telling them this is how we did it and this is what happened and this is how I changed it around. Um, you know, listen, I always used to say, fake it till you make it. It was, <laughs> it was so true. I would be like, oh yeah, get on there. And I, you know, I had my business like five minutes, you know, and I'd be acting yeah. like, but I did events for a long time. I wasn't smooth and running the business, but you know, you learn. It just, you have to start somewhere. So you, everybody learns. So it's, it's fun to look back on all those experiences now. And, you know, now my closing rate is really almost 100%, which is great. But I remember the struggle of, you know, I just didn't want to lose this client. I like, no matter what, right? And that's never always, it's not always a great thing. So it's not. But Annette, can I reassure everybody who's listening here that everything that you have talked about is standard and fundamental in every business. I can really relate to everything that you've said. And I don't work in wedding planning. I work in the field of emotional intelligence. Yeah. So I've been there too. And I'm still faking it whilst I make it. But I've been doing it for 15 years. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny. And I think that's every entrepreneur goes through all of that. So they do. You know, they and do. I have no idea. I knew the word I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs and there wasn't, you know, back in the day before I started my business, people weren't, there weren't a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, it was just, it was something that, you know, people, millionaires, basically there's so many of those now, but there weren't a lot of that. That wasn't a thing back then. So, um, but it's changed so fast. Social media is definitely making a big difference yes. and, and the online and all the way we work nowadays is so different. So um, but it's, you know, it's, uh, everybody goes through it. We're all have to go through it. So, uh, we're all in the same boat, but it's just, I think well, getting... it's a learning experience and this is where you build up your, your expertise and yeah. what people will now see from the two of us when we are professionally working at our optimum, yeah. uh, it's, we're like a swan gliding across the, the lake. Yes. And that's what people will see a high level of professionalism. What they don't see is the little feet paddling away underneath the water at 19 to the dozen really, really fast. And right. we know how to avoid all the barriers and the obstacles in the way so we can plan for them. But right. a lot of that comes with experience. It sure does. And one of the things you had mentioned also was about multitasking, which, you know, event planners are known for multitasking. You've got to be good at multitasking. Well, you know, we're always doing a million things. I'm jumping around all day on yes. all kinds of things because, you know, I'm answering all these different emails that come in. But the biggest tip is to block out time, you know, put yourself away from all the distractions and, you know, block out time for specific client work and stuff that you need to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to do that myself. You know, I, my calendar is completely blocked out with certain things that I need to do, especially now that I'm working on this program, an online digital program, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, be careful what you wish for because <laughs> 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 you know. Um, so, but it's going to be so great once it's done, but it's a lot of work to put together and, you know, it's sure. you know, I'm very excited to finally get it done and, and it's going to be great. Um, I can't wait to to get it out there to everybody. So it's going to be great. Okay. Yeah. So I have, my next question is, um, can you explain the connection between active listening, emotional intelligence and mindfulness? Sure. Uh, well, let's have a look at each of those in turn. Well, what is actively listening? Now, I'm actively listening to you at the moment, which involves uh, not only hearing the words, but understanding the emotions behind the words and also looking at how you're using your body language. Is it congruent? Is it fitting in with what I'm expecting? <laughs> and how am I actually managing that? Am I actually listening to what it is that you're saying and, and, lo and, and looking beyond the words so that we can engage at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Now, mindfulness, again, is being very much in the present moment. So whilst I'm actively listening to you, Annette, I'm not doing anything else. I'm not looking at my mobile phone. Mm 
I'm not looking at my emails. I'm not watching the television. I'm not looking out the window. I'm focused in this present moment on you. Mm -hmm. Now, you may say something that I disagree with. How do I manage my emotions around that in order that we build the relationship? Yeah, we are going to disagree and that will lead to conflict. Now, it doesn't mean to say that I'm going to punch your lights out. <laughs> what it means is that we're going to have some level of debate, discussion, disagreement, dialogue. And from that, both of us will learn through the conversation. So that's part of active listening that's part of mindfulness and that's part of emotional intelligence combining them all together they're so interlinked it's like a necklace you pick one of the beads up and all the others follow behind right right very good that's great so how do you approach managing stress and maintaining a sense of calmness when faced with tight deadlines and high pressure situations which you know in my industry that's all we have so <laughs> it's it's the same in my industry. Everybody wants everything yesterday. And again, a part of it is, is know, knowing yourself, knowing what you're capable of doing, knowing what you're capable of delivering, having the ability to say no, stopping um, in your tracks, stopping multitasking and taking appropriate breaks that you need in order to rejuvenate. Now, after you've run a very successful event, you need to celebrate that. And I hear that you go and have a massage. The best. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Everybody should take that time out because a lot of people will, will lurch from one major project to another. And sometimes we have to do that. But what you've actually got to do is to build into your day, build into your week, mm -hmm. time out for you. Now, for me, weekends are sacrosanct. I will work if I choose to. Right. So uh, the thing is, uh, I can have a couple of days where I do something completely different. Uh, now, it might mean that during the week I'm working 12 hours easily. But again, that's my choice. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing that I would like to share with you and your viewers, listeners, Annette, is, the, um, is this idea of a daily list, which a lot of time managers seem to put into everybody's structure. You must have a daily to-do list. No. I don't. I don't. I will share my tip with you. I don't have a daily to-do list because that adds to my pressure. Right. I have a weekly to-do list. Yes. Sir. By the end of the week, this is what I will have achieved. And then I fit each task into the week according to my energy levels. Right. Do I want to do this task? Have I got the energy to do it? No, I don't want to do the task, but I've got the energy. Let's get it out the way. Right. Right. So I do the same. I have a weekly, like, you know, I just write it on a piece of paper to do yes. <laughs> the yeah. old fashioned way. I mean, I, I used to have this um, electronic system and then they got rid of it and I loved it because when I would check it off, it would make this fabulous <laughs> ding and I would like feel like I, you know, accomplished a million things. But so I just write it on a piece of paper and I just list the things I need to do during the week and I, cr and I cross them off because I love the feeling of crossing all that stuff off. Um, and there was some other thing I was going to say, and I don't remember, um, I forgot what it was, but I'm sure, oh yeah, I'm sure that it'll come to mind. But yeah, so I do the same thing. I don't do daily because our schedules change so much. Sure, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, yeah. Every single call that I'm going to take, I don't let people just randomly call me. You know, you can't just call unless it's, a, you know, someone looking for, uh, you know, if they do call looking for business. But normally I let everything go to voicemail and then I pick it up because I want to be prepared yes. for what it is. And also, I, you know, I need to make sure I schedule things out. So, but I do the same thing. I, I do a weekly to do. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I think it's important to share something with you, Annette. You talked about writing it down on a piece of paper. Do you remember? Well, you probably are. You're not, you're, you're not old enough. You've you probably don't remember file of faxes from the 1980s and oh, 90s. I yes, I do. I, I've you. gone back to using a file of fax. 
And yeah. the reason why I've gone back to using a file effect is I thought, oh, I'll use all these electronic WYSI systems because yeah. they'll make me a lot more efficient. And they do. They do when they work. Yeah. But then they stop working. And you've got to have a backup. So, yes, I use Calendly. I use um, a whole host of email systems. I, I put uh, things into my electronic calendar, but they lose them. They change the times. Now, if I've written it down in my Filofax, <laughs> I have to physically rub it out. So the Filofax doesn't lose it. The Filofax doesn't change the day, the date or the time. And so it doesn't cause me any problems. Now, I, I know that it's an archaic system, but it works for me. For you. Find out what works for you. I say yeah. that all the time. You know, we, yeah. I have my team that has, we have our systems, certain specific systems. But I say to them, if there's something that works better for you, just let me know. And, you know, I'm open to changing yeah. things or you can do it your way and you don't we don't have to necessarily do it mine but you know everybody works a little bit differently um i try not to have paper that's one of my things i'm paperless so <laughs> unless i have to review a contract i have to print it because i can't review contracts online on the computer but um yeah you're making me remember the rolodexes you know when you used the cal when you yes. had, and used to yeah. roll the yeah back in the day gone are those days now but and some people still have it, you know. Some people still have flip phones, and we've never even had phones. So it's yeah, kind of no, this is it. It's back to this emotional intelligence yeah. and this self-awareness. What is it that works for you? And understand what works for you. And if somebody comes along and derides it, oh, it's very old-fashioned or whatever. Yeah, if they can show you a better way of doing it, and it works then move over to it. Right. But right. Uh, if it doesn't, stick with what you've got. Find out what works for you. Exactly. Exactly. So um, how do you approach managing stress and maintaining a sense of calmness when faced with tight deadlines? Did I ask you that already? You you have. But I would also like to say you've got to find out what it is that de-stresses you. Now, you can see yeah. this wonderful uh, view of where yeah. I live. I am in incredibly lucky yeah. so every day i will go outside and walk in nature if yeah. the weather is allowable allows me to do that yeah um so what is it that it that nourishes you and energizes you how can you re-energize yourself and then again that's part of self-awareness build that time into your day yes. a lot of people find that at the end of the day they are so shattered yeah that all they want to do is to flop down in front of the television that's great but don't do it all the time. Right. Just, well, um, I, I work out in the mornings because if I don't work out in the morning, <laughs> I won't work out at night because I'm beat, beat you know, I want to flop down <laughs> and watch some yeah. tiny little TV. I'm not a, yeah. I'm not a big, there are a lot of sports on in my house. So, you know, we've been watching a lot of Yankees, which aren't doing very well. We're not very happy. <laughs> that time, but I am a big Yankee fan. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so it's, I have to get my morning routines in. I don't book anything until before 10 o'clock. Um, you know, I have to have my mornings for myself. Otherwise I won't do it. And that's really, really important to me. And I feel, even though sometimes I don't want to go and do it, but you know, I feel so much better when I do that. And this is you know, because there's so much going on. I'm running a business and I yeah. have a team and I have this course and I have events and I have clients. <laughs> you know, in my home life. And it's a lot of stuff. So it, it is, great. it is. And, and it's all part of this self-awareness. It's knowing yourself. It's knowing your peak times of the day. Yeah. Now for me, between half past seven and nine o'clock in the morning, I am working on emails because I know I can deal with the most contentious email that comes in <laughs> and I can fire off a, an emotionally intelligent response right. at that time. Right. Any other time of the day, and the email pings in. I might read it, but I won't do anything with it if I don't want to. Right. Uh, because exactly. nobody nobody is going to die. The world is not going to implode. <laughs> the stock exchange is not going to crash yeah. because I haven't sent an email. I know. It's a very good point. And that's what I was going to say um, earlier that I forgot mm -hmm. about was um, I don't review contracts. So if I have to do anything with numbers... <laughs> 
something like that, I do it early in the morning because my brain is fresh. At night, I can't be putting budgets together and reviewing contracts and all that. So I do it first thing in the morning. And you're right. You don't have to respond to every single email right away. Sometimes I'll read something and be like, oh, Lord, here we go again. And then I just flag it and put it away. And then when I read it again, it doesn't feel so big as it did when I first read it. So you know, it's always good to, if you, those kind of emails that you get are, you know, if you're feeling emotional about it or something's happening in that email that you might not say the right thing the first time, put it away, go back later. No one's, you don't have to answer right away. And I'm guilty because I don't have any emails in my inbox. I'm one of those girls. And it's hard to I see people with like 14,000 things they haven't opened. And it makes me want to, oh my goodness, I get very it makes me nervous, but I just work everything or I flag it. So, um, you know, that's, that's me. That's how I work. And I try to teach my team to do the same. So I'm it, sure it is, well, I'm one of those girls that have 30,000 emails oh, in their goodness. inbox and I've read all of them. I've looked at them, but I just yeah. keep them there. And I've got yeah. systems within my email system okay, well, to, to make yeah. it work for me. Yeah. So we're, we're different in that. You have a different way of doing it. I have a different way of doing things. <laughs> We're both successful different. entrepreneurs because of it rather than exactly. being despite it. That's funny. Okay, good. So what strategies have you found effective in creating a culture that values reflection and mindfulness? Well, I, I think culture comes from the leadership and uh, the culture of Nate Productions and the culture of your business comes from you, Annette. You set the framework, you set the guidelines around which people will work. And anybody who is being very successful with you is working within those guidelines and frameworks. So uh, in terms of Going back to that question, what strategies have I found in creating a culture that values reflection, uh, reflectful, re sorry, values reflection and mindfulness? Mm -hmm. It's taking the lead from you around how you value reflection and mindfulness. And a lot of work that I do with senior leaders is actually saying to them, you are responsible for the culture. You are responsible for the emotional climate within your organization. People will take their lead from you, their emotional need from you. So you've just got to be aware of it. Right. So what reflection and what mindfulness are you practicing in order to build up the team and build up the, core, the culture in an appropriate way? Yeah, that's so true. I, I'm all about having fun but I'm also very serious about doing a great job and getting the job done. So, you know, we're, that's something that everyone knows in my team and, and they need to, they could, they need to take their vacations and be with their families and family comes yes. first. And all yes. of that. So, yes. you know, I'm, even though we might be crunched and it's, Oh my gosh, but you know, um, this vacation that I took was the first time I took a vacation and I had my team take care of everything and I did not work. I mean, I did have, I was planning my own birthday party the following week when I returned. So I was getting a few texts from my, my team, but um, other than that, I didn't, it was, it was, I was set up that way. Now that took a long time for me to get there, right? It doesn't happen oh, it overnight. Does. It you're does. Starting your business, you're going to be, you have to be involved the whole time. You're not going to necessarily have a team right away. Um, but I'm fortunate now after so many years, I do have a lot of people that are, that are taking care of me um, and helping me with this. So I'm fortunate to do that. It's it's hard because, you know, I'm a maniac on the emails and I'm a maniac making sure everybody gets customer services huge for us. So, yes. um, you know, you just have to be aware of that. But uh, it's good to to know the the balance of that, you know. So how are emotion and emotions evolved involved in driving the climate within an organization? And I think we touched a little bit on that, but let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah, Let, let's unpick that a bit further because um, we know that planning weddings are incredibly stressful. <laughs> yeah. And again, the team will take their lead from you. You're yeah. setting that emotional climate. So you, if you are incredibly stressed and in panic mode all the right. time, 
people will pick up on that panic and some people will work very positively with it, but a lot of people can't work positively with it. Right. So you've actually mindfully got to go back and think and reflect how are you reacting when things get tough. Now, if you're angry all the time, you can't expect a happy team working for you. So true. So if you're angry with the clients because they've set you a set of objectives that are unattainable, then you need to deal with that with the client, not with the team. It's not their fault. So how do you work with and how do you manage your anger? This is all part of the self-regulation component of emotional intelligence. Right. It's a if, lot. if you want your team to be happy, what is it that you need to do emotionally to create that environment, to create that climate for them to be happy? Right, right. I always say it starts at the top. I know when I was in corporate for many years, you know, if the top wasn't good or happy or, you know, it was a nightmare. But um, I always tell my team, you know, when we're on with the client and the client's there and we're setting up, don't tell them any problems. Don't go to the client and say, oh my gosh, the linens didn't show up or, you know, well, the backdrop yeah. fell down or whatever. It's not the color you want it. Don't tell them anything. Always come to me and we will resolve the issue before they even know it and something happens. And, yes. you know, and also I don't allow if, if anybody isn't right with my team, they need to, I need to know, right? So if we're on site yeah. we're setting up and someone's not being right with them, they're being rude to them or they're being difficult with them, they come to me, they tell me and I'll take care of it. So, and I always do it in such a nice way because I always like to listen, everybody's important. I have a hundred people coming to set up an event and I make sure that every single one of them feels like they're just as important as the next person, which I think is very, very important because, you know, they're all, they all have a job to do. And I, I, you know, I work it, I'll jump in and sweep the floor and wipe, mop up the whatever. <laughs> I do all that. Um, but, you know, um, I used to move tables and all that stuff too. I, I, I let everybody else do that stuff now. But, um, and now with all the unions, you can't touch anything. So it's like a big deal, but uh, it's a nightmare. So, uh, but it's a really important that I try to, you're so right about that is setting the tone with your team that, you know, we're here to have fun, but we're also here to get the job done professionally, right? So sure. I know there's a fine line, uh, right? There can be a fine line of having fun and and not being professional. And that's really, really important that, uh, you know, but don't, don't do, say, tell the client anything. I, I've had that happen before when someone on my team early on, uh, went ahead and told the client something happened and I, I just about died, but, you, you know, you learn. That's just the way it is. You just tell everybody not to do that. You assume people aren't going to do that, but you, you can't assume. You got to make sure that you set the ground rules of what's going to happen yes. right with the client. So I think. Well, you also talked about having fun in it. And I think we need to understand that because yeah. when we are working in flow, when everything is going really, really well and we are being professional, it is fun. And a lot of people think that fun or they're quite fun with putting on a, a silly hat and a red nose and doing the conga around the office. That's not having fun. We do that fun. all the time. What are you talking about? Yeah, well, you can do that when it's appropriate and exactly. if, you, if you consider that to be fun. But actually yeah. professionally delivering to a client and resolving many issues and overcoming problems is fun, isn't it? Because at the end of that um at the end of the delivery of that project, you can actually reflect and think, okay, that didn't go as well as I wanted it to, but look at what we did. Didn't that go brilliantly? I didn't right. think it would go that well, but hey, we've all pulled together, rallied around, and we've done a really good job. I can enjoy my massage now. Yeah, exactly. And I always do, believe me. But here's the deal. When it comes with events, there's always plan B, C, and D, right? You're always yes. With something yes. Like the people don't know what's supposed to happen, right? Now you've got your your rituals for weddings, but people run weddings a lot different. There's not every they don't do every single ritual that's normal for a wedding. So something might happen where 
it didn't happen the way we had planned it, but we did something different. Nobody's going to be the wiser. So as long as it's not the major thing that the client needed, I needed to have these purple, whatever, right? They have to get over it. Sometimes it just happens. Something happens. The truck didn't show up or they had an accident or, I mean, things happen. So you just have to get past that. But no one knows is the wiser and it all works out. It all works out in the end. So just well, look, let me share with you something else. And I, I don't often share this, but this is a secret to my success. And you, you've just <laughs> okay. alluded to it. Okay, good. When, I was, when I was a teenage boy, I was absolutely fascinated by conjuring magic. Uh-huh. And uh, the, the greats such as Penn and Teller and oh, yes. uh, uh, some of the, the British uh, magicians that you probably wouldn't have heard of. But um, the, the important thing with regards to making a magic trick work is that you don't tell the audience what the outcome of the magic trick is. You let the magic trick unfold. Right. So if it doesn't, if it starts to go wrong, they aren't aware of the fact that it's gone wrong. And if you've got the ability to recover and deliver the the conjuring trick with panache, there you are, you've done a good job. Right. Now take that and apply it to your business. Uh, you know what it is that you're trying to achieve. It doesn't matter how you go about achieving it, but you don't tell people, well, we'll do it A, B, C, D, E, and F, because if it doesn't work out that way, then um, you end up with egg on your face. You end up looking silly. So the best thing to do is to say, this is what we'll we'll look like when we get to the end point. How does that make you feel? Is that what you're looking for? What is it I need to do? What is it that I've missed? What can I do to delight you? Right, right. So true. So um, how can leaders and managers work with emotions more effectively? Well, firstly, it's down to self-awareness. Firstly, it's understanding your own emotions and the impact that they have on other people. So if you've got a particular client that really annoys you, you need to be aware of that. So you don't come off the phone and then start shouting at the team and That's a very silly, superficial example, but it actually highlights the the underlying principles of what I'm trying to say and then chunk it up into the bigger picture. Um, What is it that's going on in your life that's driving you emotionally? Because if there are things and there will be things happening in your life outside of work, that are causing you some emotional turmoil, then you need to understand that work with it and manage it appropriately. Again, Easy for me to say, <laughs> yeah. very difficult to no, do. It is. I mean, life gets, you know, life happens. I, my, it father, does. my father passed away last year and it was right before two really big events. So he passed on a Friday oh, and that next yes. week, Tuesday and Thursday were big, big events. And I got my, thank God for my team. They helped me. And of course my clients were very understanding and I was there. I was you know, in the trenches. And I think it helped me, you know, the shock of it all, but it's, yes. it's, it's, that was the biggest thing in my life that had happened at the time, which was uncontrolled. Like you had no control over anything at that time, you know, usually everything's scheduled out and, but man, that was, um, that was something else. And to have to go through those events and do all that. So, you know, it happens, um, you know, you just have to keep going and it's so people around you are going to support you and help you. And, you yes. know, it's just part of life. Things are going to happen. So emotions are flying for sure when that's when that stuff's happening. It is. And, and let's let's have a look at some other things that goes on in life that we don't often talk about. We all have to go to the doctor at some point. Right. We all have to right. go to the dentist. <laughs> I have to go to the audiologist because I'm deaf. So <laughs> I have to go schedule in hospital appointments. I had a call this afternoon from my hairdresser. She's had to cancel an appointment because of a death in her family. Right. Um, but we all have to go and get our hair cut. We have to do the washing. We have to iron our clothes. I know, right? We have so to much. do the same with our beds. Look, the, these are all part of life. This is everybody has to do it. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether you're the CEO of a major 
billion pound organization or whether you're in a startup not earning much money right. everybody has to do these things so you actually have to factor them into your working life whether you like it or not yeah and that's the thing i used to be afraid to say you know i'm not available at 10 o'clock on friday right i would try that's to right. move things yeah. and that i was like no 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 this is yeah. i'm not available because i'm getting my hair cut i don't say that but and then <laughs> doing but like there are things that you know have to happen in your life every you still have to live a life right and take care of yourself so well this is it this goes back to what i talked about right at the beginning it's about being self-ish understand yourself yeah. make yeah. sure that you do the most important things crikey if i didn't go to the audiologist to get my hearing aid sorted out i couldn't hear anybody therefore i couldn't work yeah and you couldn't hear this conversation right so yes this is it so yes okay. i've got a factory going getting more batteries for my hearing aid so all of these <laughs> things are, are vitally important yes. and then look at our cars look at our automobiles they yes. need servicing we right. need to put gas in them um well, or we need to charge them if we've got an electric car all all these sort of things they need servicing we've got body work that needs doing it needs cleaning all all of these yeah. things need to happen this is life the, these are things that we have to mindfully build into our working day into yeah. our business whether yeah. we like it or not and that's being mindful and that's being emotionally intelligent yes yes that's so so good so how do you foster a sense of presence and focus at work especially when distractions and um, competing priorities abound and i think we kind of touched on what those are but you know how do you um have a sense of presence and focus just recognize what it is that you're doing at that particular moment in time and work on it. Now, I was working on a number of projects prior to coming on to speak with you, Annette. Uh, this is late afternoon for me. That's right. So I've done a, a full working day and, I and I wanted to, time. yeah, I wanted to complete 10 videos. I've got eight completed. Wow, now, that's impressive. Uh, I, well, a, a lot of that comes with experience. When yeah. I did my first video, it took 48 hours. Uh, the cat was dead. My wife and I were talking about divorce. The children wouldn't speak to oh, me no. any further. But uh, it took 48 hours. Nowadays, I can I can do a high quality video and it will yeah. take me a couple of hours. But a lot of that comes with experience. Yes. So whilst I was doing that, I couldn't do other things, so I couldn't respond to emails. Right. Whilst I was doing that, I couldn't do other things. Now I've got some planning that I need to do, and I, I've got my accounts to work on. So I actually have to take each and every chunk of work, concentrate on it, not worry about any other pieces of work and, right. and learn to prioritize what is important within my business in order to make it and keep it successful. Yeah, that's so true. I'm about to venture down the video roads. Um, I'm, you know, I do this, but I am going to be creating more videos where I'm teaching and, and for my students and a lot more just about yeah. what I'm doing for everybody. And, um, you know, so I have to schedule out and we're going to, you know, we're putting all the strategy together of what they're, what that's going to, we're going to plan it all out and then I'm going to do the videos. Um, and so I'm excited about it, but it does take like the thought of, you know, planning out a day and putting my videos. <laughs> I know once I do it, it's not going to be so bad. Because I can talk about events all day long, but on, um, you know, and the business and that. So once I get started, it's hard to shut me off. But, uh, but it does, it takes some scheduling and it takes some discipline to really, I mean, discipline's a big thing in, in being an entrepreneur. You know, you really have to have a lot of discipline in so many ways. Of all the things we talked about, you know, today is, is a lot of its discipline. It is. And, and look, um, it, a lot of it is fear of the unknown. We will put off jobs that we don't want to do or that are, are, seem impossibly big. Right. And I'm a great advocate for giving it a go. And once you've actually 
broken the back of it or you've started to do it, you will find that you will get a natural energy from it. Mm -hmm. So um, the the other thing that I live by is uh, imperfect action is better than perfect inaction. So just give it a go and just stick something up and it's going to be rubbish. Uh, But as long as it's fit for purpose and you've done it with love and you've done it to the highest level of your capability at the time, you can always go back and redo it but just just don't worry and duly about oh it's not it's not perfect no it never will be i look at but nobody wants it perfect anyway i think no, no, that's it. your authentic self yes is really whatever yes. you want because if you're perfect if you you know if you're perfect then they're gonna you know people aren't nobody's perfect so you know it's better they're gonna feel better and more comfortable talking to you i know when i first started doing the show which was during covid i started it because Um, you know, my industry shut down and I started interviewing people in my industry, like, what are you doing? What are the next steps? Trying to help people in our industry. And it's evolved and it's been a couple years now, which is pretty, you know, it's great. And I love doing it. In the beginning, though, when I first started doing this, I was scared to death. I, I was like, I cannot get on video. It's the worst thing ever. I can't do it. And, you know, it's now I enjoy it and I love it and I love talking to people. So uh, it's funny though, but again, just doing something, get you practice with it and it becomes second nature, everything. Like when you first got a new phone and when you first, you know, all new stuff becomes old hat. So, um, you know, it's just go ahead and jump in and who cares? Because I just did some videos and I criticized them, you know, we're the worst critics of ourselves. And I criticized oh, yes. we were too dark and I didn't like the way I looked and I was too close to this and, up, 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 and I want my hair. And, oh, you know, girls are crazy. So, uh, uh, boys are crazy too. They just might yeah, not express it. So. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was, you know, uh, it's hard. It's hard to get on video and it's, you know, all kinds of different things. But once you do it and, you know, honestly, if you're just being your authentic self um, and it comes from the heart, people are going to see that. And that's what's really important. It is, Annette, you've actually come out with the key word there and you've used it a couple of times. Just forget everything else that was said around it, everybody. The key word is authentic. Mm -hmm. Yep, authentic. So thank you so much. I mean, I have a list of so many things that we could talk about, but I don't want to take any more of your time. you got to go out to that beautiful background there you have there. I really enjoyed talking to you. How can people find you? Oh, Annette, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I've really enjoyed it. And, I, and you, you know, time just has compressed down. So, crikey, we've almost been going an hour. I know. Isn't that amazing? Because I thought, <laughs> oh, it's only five minutes. Well, it isn't. It was a really, really good concentrate, uh, co- concentrated conversation. Thank so thank you. Yes, you. Yes. How people can get hold of me. Uh, I have a Facebook group, which is my emotional intelligence lab feel free to come along and join uh you can find me on linkedin robin hills that's r-o-b-i-n-h-i-l-l-s very easy to uh to uh, learn and remember not so easy for everybody to um to say i found <laughs> so, um I, also you can find me at the ei for change website ei that's uh, E-I number four, change.com. That's awesome. And Christy will put that in the, um, she's already put your LinkedIn's in the chat. But what is it specifically that you do and who is your ideal client? So people are, are clear on who it is that uh, you work with. I have a range of online courses. Okay. I have uh, about, well, between two to three dozen online courses based around emotional intelligence. My ideal client is anybody who is interested in learning, learning about themselves, learning about emotional intelligence, and learning about how they can apply emotional intelligence in business. Now, I can't define a particular client as being a certain age, a certain group, a certain gender. It's anybody and everybody Uh, anybody and everybody who is interested in emotional intelligence. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So 
his Robin's information is in the chat. Please reach out if you want to talk more about this or learn more about it. Check out his online programs. Obviously, you know what I'm going through right now doing my online. So <laughs> you can appreciate that. Thank you so much. Loved having you. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, let's talk. We'll get back next week and we'll talk about more great stuff. All right. Take care. Talk to you Brilliant. soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.